Juan and Jose to La Cosa Club. Also, the, the peanuts in Spain. I had no clue how American 
So for me, if I tell you more than any of these, Hindus would be one, and the other one, Yambalaya. Because the first time I had any connection with the South, with Yambalaya. I'm pronouncing this well? Perfect. And this was a rice dish, and obviously me and being from Spain, and knowing that the Spanish people came so early, the South, I'm like, sure, Southern cooking equals Spain. I am wrong. <laughs> so, I asked that question because the book, one of my goals for the book was to talk about, or to start the conversation that the South is so diverse and there's so much more to it that um, hasn't been told and there's so much more to discover, there's so much more to explore and the future is is so exciting. And so your reference to Jambalaya is really wonderful because if you look at the South, and if you go to page 11, I think, in your book. Yes. You can see the size of the South compared to that part uh, of Europe. And think about how many different cuisines exist here. And then look at the South. And a lot of people see... So their food is one thing, it's one cuisine. Um, but as you start looking at examples like jambalaya, you start to realize um, how fascinating the cultural exchange is that occurs um, within this area of the South. And that's kind of where it starts. And that's, that's the, the foundation of that, that cuisine is those Spanish influences coming together with the indigenous crops of the South and that becoming jambalaya. I mean, essentially it's paella. That's exactly the same thing. Um, and that example can go, I mean, the whole, you know, the book is, is centered around that idea that um, if you start to pick this apart and go from state to state and then within each state, uh, start to realize how many different cuisines exist within each state, and then how many cuisines exist within those cuisines. Um, and it's it's really great for me because I realize I don't I don't know anything, and I've got so so much um, to learn. But what really really excites me is the future of Southern food. We're such a young country. I mean, how old is Spain? <laughs> I'm not going to answer this because tomorrow I will be all around to live in Spain and uh, everybody will disagree with me on the right, on the left, on the north, and on the south. And I'm like, I'm not getting into that. But I have to know with America alone. Um, I, I have to wait. But, but what you are describing very much is a young chef that myself, traveling through Spain, as more as I know about Spain, and different TV shows I've done in Spain, sometimes hundreds of them, it's not a lot of people that know Spain better than I do. But now I became 50 this year. Every time I go back to Spain, I realize, actually, I know nothing. And every time I visit a town, a village, I discovered things that in my brain I cannot believe I never knew about them before. So what I'm understanding is that today, Chambra, the expert by any means of southern cooking, a person we find the right person to guide us on what southern cooking is. How many of you are telling me that every morning you wake up and you travel through the South, you discover many things and almost make you feel like actually, as much as we see you as the expert, that you are learning everyday things that you couldn't believe you are finding these kind of new ingredients, techniques, dishes in every one of your expeditions. Is that the case? Yeah, I think, I mean, to me, it's just an overwhelming idea and thought that 
this research will never end. And food has taught me so much about the rest of the world. Um, because when we start talking about jambalaya and its origins in Spain, then I want to learn about Spain. And I want to know why paella becomes what it is and how, what, where, how, where did paella come from? How did it change once I got into Louisiana? Who were the immigrants that, um, the, the, where the exchange occurred with the Native Americans? And, I mean, it just goes on and on. So if that is, is, is a good example of what was happening throughout the South, you have to understand the immigrants and their cultures. Because I think that cuisine is at least Southern cuisine. I would imagine it goes for, for the rest of for the world as well, or any cuisine, but I think it's a mix of the geography and where you are, the plants and ingredients that can thrive there, but most importantly, the people who brought those ingredients there as immigrants, um, and the base flavors and traditions uh, of that um, of that culture, and how those three things add up to creating a singular uh, cuisine within all these different micro regions. It's just so, so fascinating. So where I'm from, in Appalachia, I, um, I grew up eating sour corn. So you're from uh, Virginia. From what town in Virginia? So I grew up in uh, Wise County, Virginia, a little town called Pound, P-O-U-N-D. Anybody from there? <laughs> Hello, people. She actually is from there. Hello. My cousin. <laughs> so, how, how old were you when you left that area? I moved away, well, I moved away from Virginia when I was 18 and then went to Charleston. So, so you were a Virginia boy. That's it right there. Can we see it? <laughs> Do you know this guy every time? Can you tell us about you the tooth very quickly? Because every time you find something new, in the south, a grain. You, I heard that you tattoo yourself, your body. I mean, I feel embarrassed to be asking you to show us your body, <laughs> especially now. But I think it's important. This is almost like the caves and all human beings painting things in the caves. Yeah. Now we don't paint in the caves anymore because we put the paintings in our body. <laughs> so why do you tattoo these new findings in your body? And that's why we're here. Well, it's, it's a constant, constant reminder of, of where I'm from and, and, and what's important. Um, I would love to take you to Appalachia someday and, and show you the cooking there. It's so, so, so unique to any, anywhere in the world. Um, I was speaking about um, sour corn. So have you ever had sour corn? So it's something that I thought everyone knew about and everyone ate. Um, but it's this really uh, unique tradition that exists uh, where I'm from. And it came from German immigrants using Native American it, uh, ingredients. So making sauerkraut of corn. And so that exists there in that place. And I was born into that, eating it from a tiny, tiny, tiny little kid. So to me, that was Appalachian cuisine. That is the cuisine of that place. But it's just like that Jambalaya story. You know, once you start to see uh, the cultural exchange that occurs, you truly realize the, the importance of, of understanding the, the immigrants that, that shape these cuisines and, and what their base flavor memories are. Um, and then if that's the case, if that's, if that's the formula, if it's the, the immigrants, the, the ingredients, and the geography, that shapes cuisine. That's why these things end up on the plate. The future of Southern food is really exciting. I mean, what's the food going to look like in, in uh, New Orleans in, in 20 years? You know, we're, we're constantly changing. I think Southern food is constantly changing. 
and we're so young, um, we don't have quite the tradition of, traditions of that are as old as Japan or, or Spain. Um, so I think we have so much more ahead of us. Like, as an example, how old was Modena when they decided to make balsamic vinegar? I don't, I don't know. I'm just, we still have so much room and so much opportunity to create new traditions. And those new traditions being influenced by uh, the immigrant population is just amazing. So for yet some rain, a French philosopher, I don't mention French people in public often. Uh, <laughs> But this guy in 1826, probably the most influential food philosopher in modern history, he said, Tell me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are. What we are hearing from you is that very much to be a southerner, you are not describing the people of the South by the politics or the wars of the past, but about the foods of today and the foods of the future, understanding that the South is this ever-changing landscape full of people that they were the native, the native tribes when the Europeans arrived, uh, new immigrants that they've been coming through centuries, and that still today you are this, this amazing landscape where creativity, based on traditions, is gonna be giving a way forward the meaning of what the from the South means. Is that what you're telling us? Yes, and to me, it makes me realize that there's, in actuality, so many undiscovered cuisines in the South. That, that, that like they, they exist, but they, they, and they've always existed, but they haven't been uh, maybe singled out enough to say, well, within this part of the South, there's a hundred different cuisines. So I believe that. For the cuisines, and we'll get into the cuisines, but pow pow. I am a young guy in America. I think I know everything there is to know. Because why? You're a chef, you know everything. That was supposed to be you. <laughs> And one day my daughter comes back from the Billy Goat Trail. And Daddy, Daddy, I have a pow pow from the Billy Goat Trail. <laughs> <laughs> what is a pow pow? It's amazing fruit. And I'm looking at my daughter like, get out of here, child. I know you go to a private school, but you are over your favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and she shows me this thing that she picked up on her own in the Billy Goat Trail at the Potomac River. And I go to Google and I'm like, head of house. <laughs> and I go to the Ar National Archives and there is a peace treaty between the US and the Indian tribes of the North discussing who is gonna get the pop pow orchard. And I'm like, pop pow. <laughs> and all of a sudden, my daughter, American born, is teaching me about an amazing American fruit that 99% of America doesn't know exists. <laughs> and here you have, on page 327, that reason is only the right reason why you did a good thing by this book. The most American fruit that America doesn't know about Actually, the fruit that actually can make America great again. <laughs> it's a fruit that America doesn't know. So, Pau Pau is one of those things that really grow my mind. Uh, I bought few trees and I gave them to a few farmers. You did? Oh. In Pennsylvania, different types of Pau Pau. Because I was fascinated by how it's possible that they've been in America for so long. And just my daughter had to tell me about papas, and I never learned about papas. Tell us about papas and what it means to rediscover an ingredient that is part of America, but America is lying about. Can papas make this together with the people again? Well, 
I mean, what you just um, spoke about is, I think, why it's so important to keep these traditions alive and to seed save and to protect these things, because you've never heard of it, you experienced it, and the first thing you did is you researched it, and all of a sudden you find yourself reading about trees. Um, and so your, your food is, can teach us so much about uh, history and the past and lessons learned, and I just think that's just so amazing. When I went to Charleston to go to culinary school in the low country in South Carolina, I would go into these kitchens um, and start telling people about the food I grew up with. No one had ever heard any of it. I mean, I brought sour corn in, and nine out of ten people spit it out. Because you think of corn as something that's sweet, but when you eat it and it's sour, your body is going to spit that out, it's bad. Um, and pawpaw was another one of those things that no one had ever even heard of. And I grew up, like, there's um, children's songs about it. But a pawpaw is like a cross between, you get to taste it. It's like a cross between banana, papaya. It's this tropical fruit that, it's, it's, it's crazy. How many of you have ever had the pawpaw? Wow. Bye -bye. How many of you ever went to harvest papaw in the wild? How many of you are dying to eat papaw tomorrow? <laughs> I think you're going to have to wait for next season. <laughs> I don't want to sound like now America between the Yambalaya, the Spain, and the Bahia. I just, he said it, but. <laughs> The, the vertical peaks in Osobal Island, of Georgia. To me, when I learned that in the 16th century, the Spanish, whatever, some people call them conquistador, they dropped the vertical peaks, and that today, those peaks that came from Europe, from Spain, black hoof, black body, uh, today they exist in an island like Osobo, and that is many places in the south, this keeps reinforcing something like we, we think like the south is very conservative in their ways, but actually, what I'm hearing from you reading your first book, your next book, that you're telling us a story of a south that is super inclusive, that understands that they are who they are today, but they are part of these centuries of contributions by different um, people and traditions that came from far away. This has to be fascinating because you are going through the discovery of who you are, one place, one tradition, one ingredient at a time. Yeah, the Osobov story is, it's a history lesson. If you eat a hand made from an Osobov pig, you want to know more about it. And so then you learn about the, the Spaniards coming to that coast and dropping off all these animals and seeds and, and ingredients to allow them to, to grow so that when they came back to take over, they would have um, lots of food. Well, that never happened. Um, but these ingredients that can withstand the test of time and still thrive, those kind of become our ingredients because it's kind of all we know. It's if you, if you um, talk to someone from that island, that's the pork they grew up eating. That's, the, that's, what, that's where their brain goes when, when you say ham or, or, or pork chop. But it's, it's from, from it's crazy rare cream of insanely delicious um, pork. And that those those that exact kind of story exists everywhere. I think so much of it hasn't been tapped into yet throughout the South. So chef like that barber up in New York, a guy that is an amazing uh, leader that we respect and his friend, um, protecting seeds, but coming up with new breeds of those seeds. Um, I know that for you this is being super important. Uh, I know that you were amazed when you discovered 
uh, your grandmother's kind of seeds collection. And that's one of the reasons you kind of began the touring new seeds in your forearms. And, and this goes next to obviously supporting farmers, farmers that take the risk of coming up with new, uh, new hurdles, new protecting a seed that they are disappearing, crop that they are disappearing, and when a crop disappears, it's almost like the identity of the South disappears with them. And you are one of those chefs in America and around the world that you've been at the forefront of making sure that you will not support only, obviously, those seeds, but the farmers, the producers, that they are protecting every one of those seeds. Uh, this has been always very important for you. My family is seed safe because they like the flavor of the food. It's so delicious. We always go back to deliciousness. And we, we crave certain flavors. And what happens along the way, as these seeds are saved, they are named after a place or person. Um, and they carry the story of that place. And it's a constant reminder of those things. But people always ask, why the effort to save? Because when you're a farmer, you have one acre. That one acre has to produce the money that puts your kids through college. But if you're seed saving, you're saving, you're not seed selling. So you're, you're taking up this valuable real estate on your farm to save these seeds. And why would you do that? Um, because those seeds carry multiple generations of wisdom. And we can't just throw that away. Um, and not only are those seeds um, the carriers of those um, traditions and those stories, they're way more delicious, which also means they're way more nutritious. So Mother Nature tricks us. She makes the most nutritious food the most delicious food because we always reach for pleasure. We always go for the more pleasurable thing. And so if we start breeding out the deliciousness, we're breeding out the nutrition, and so we find ourselves having to eat more and more and more to get the nutrition that our body needs, but then we're also losing the, the, the flavor, the deliciousness that these, these cultures uh, are built upon. So Thanksgiving is coming soon. Me as an immigrant to America, Thanksgiving is something my family celebrates in an amazing way. Uh, I know that family in the South, not like other parts of America or other parts of the world, don't celebrate in the same way. I would say family in the South goes hand by hand. Um, you talk about your grandmother. Tell us a little bit about your connection to cooking and family, childhood memories, what it means to you who you are, thanks to those moments that you connect who you are, to those culinary family traditions. So, uh, my grandmother um, had a garden that was acres, which is what most people would call a, a farm these days. And my earliest memories were, my chores were making food, or, or harvesting, manicuring, grating cabbage or sauerkraut. But at a very, very young age, I got to taste food out of the ground. Food while it's still alive and vibrant, and to see where food comes from. One of my, my absolute favorite memories um, when I think about you know, family and, and, and food is the first time I saw my grandmother reach her hand through the earth and pull out a potato and then wipe the dirt away and the skin away and then put salt on it and then eating it right there in the sun, the warmth of the soil, that stuck with me. And I can relive that in my, my brain a million times over. And those are things that start to slowly develop that passion for food that, that I have now. And when I was a kid, um, we would grow uh, 
pretty much everything we ate. And so we ate a lot of vegetables. Very little meat, actually. Um, but when you walked into her home, the first thing you saw was the kitchen table. It was right in the middle of the kitchen, and you didn't go past that. <laughs> you stayed right there, and there was always activity going on. There was always something being prepped and preserved and canned, um, something being cooked. Um, and that's where people came, when you sat down at the table and you caught up, and that's how you, know, you, you stayed connected as a community, as a young kid. That's where I saw the true power of the table, what, what food can do to, to, bring, to bring people together. So, family is very important because sometimes it's what we fall back when things get hard and sad. Uh, we are only as good as the people we have around us. In the good times, especially in the hard times. And Sean, you for me, you've been this amazing role model that you went through personal hardships and you didn't kept them for yourself. But you went out there and you began sharing them and becoming a leader, not only in the culinary and everything you taught people like me and so many others, but you became a person that shared personal hardships with our profession. Today when you go to a restaurant and you're a chef, the way we take care of our own sometimes is sending more food and more drinks. And when you're full of food and drinks, the next round is more food and more drinks. <laughs> and then before you know, sure, uh, people tend to say you're obese, I'm like, you're kidding me. <laughs> and our profession that is a profession of plenty, of being generous, that generosity sometimes becomes a problem. Uh, Sean, you became amazing and forthcoming and open in a way that helped people like me understand who I am too. And understanding that our profession is beautiful. That sometimes us, the chefs, the cooks, the waiters, anybody that works in our business, but also people like you, that you are also part of who we are in many ways. That our same profession that we love becomes also a dark later, like something I don't want to be close by because I get overweight or I get over drunk. And that's a reality. And I love that you became a leader and you spoke about it and you shared like many of us we never do about the beauty of who we are but also about the hardships that we go through becoming who we are. Can you share with us that personal experience that you want. So, one of the things that a lot of people are starting to learn about being a chef or the restaurant industry is we are trained to do whatever it takes to take care of the guests. And that oftentimes is very, very stressful. And our nervous systems just aren't built for that kind of extended dysregulation for so long. Um, and so you have to find a way to, to calm down, to settle your nervous system. Um, and when you're around booze all day, that's the, easy, that's the easy grab. And when I decided to uh, go public with um, my sobriety and my new journey, I was told that it was a bad idea. So, you were drinking too much? Yes, so, um, when, I, when I decided to completely stop drinking, I went to this amazing treatment center in Arizona for 45 days, and it was there that I realized how, how for so many years I hadn't even considered taking care of myself. I was so obsessed with taking care of the team and, and, and the guests. And it was just to have 45 days um, to think clear-headed without a telephone, without a TV, without 
anything, just um, intense, intense learning and um, therapy, it, it completely changed the way I cook, it changed the way I communicate, it changed the way and um, as a human I'm now a father of an eight month old kid, I don't think that would have happened um, if I would have stayed on that. And it's, it can really, really suck you in. And it's normalized. It's just what happens in the restaurant industry. And it's just, it's not a big deal. Um, so when I decided to change my path and start to take better care of myself, I was, you're told when you're in uh, recovery that you can't talk about it in the press. You can't be public about it. That made no sense to me, um, because I've been given this incredible gift of having this platform to, um, to have people to listen to what, I, to what I'm saying. And so after um, the New York Times article came out, because for someone like me who was known for having one of the most insane bourbon collections in the world, maybe the most insane bourbon collection in the world, to just stop drinking and that's, you know, that was a wake-up call for a lot of people around me. But that was January 2017. And I'll say that since that New York Times article came out and then the episode of Chef's Table came out that, um, that discussed that as well, I get five to seven people a week, complete strangers, thanking me for saving their lives. I mean, that is just... I never thought that like, my contribution to the food world would be uh, anything more than a plate of sugar grits. <laughs> um, and to be able to... You know, uh, Good grits are important. Yeah. <laughs> You're telling me. Um, to get these letters from mothers saying, you saved my son's life. He saw that you wanted to make changes and you're, you were happier and healthier than you've ever been. He asked me if he could get a treatment, and now he's the happiest and healthiest. And I mean, geez, what a gift. Okay, the rest of you, you know what you need to do tonight. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Greece, uh, and it's very funny you mentioned Greece because I'm from, uh, again, North Spain. Now, no south, no. And when corn came to Spain, especially in the north, a lot of water, a lot of rain, corn grew very well. We would use the corn in the early days to mainly feed animals. It took somehow time when harvests were not so very plentiful in other, in other moments that people began eating corn as as you, we will eat grits here in the South. We didn't call it grits, we call it, you know, Mike, it's corn, the name of the plant. And it's very funny because when you come to America, as an immigrant, you are like, man, these people eat so weird. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean it as a joke, they mean it seriously. But then as you start going through, this kind of thing like, man, they eat oatmeal for breakfast, what British people has gone to America. <laughs> but then I began learning that actually, as deeper I got into what American cooking meant, deeper I saw that sometimes in Europe we will be having kind of the same traditions, even we call it different names, or we will eat them in different ways, but it's essentially it was almost the same thing. This kind of dry corn pudding, call it whatever. So at times we have a belief that we are very different from each other, but in the moment you get beat, you realize that we are so much equal to each other. That's a matter where you come from. Yes, you are discovering the South, and as you are an expert, at the same time you are learning about the place you come from. When you go around the world, are you amazed sometimes? by connections beyond Europe, that you see that the same traditions in the South somehow 
are the same conditions in other particles. So, after writing this book um, and taking some time off from, from the restaurant world, I had a lot of time to think about and to, to wonder, to be curious about what the common thread is that we all share. And we all know that the best food is cooked by grandmothers and, and it's cooked in homes. And we refer to that as comfort food or um, soul food. But food that is cooked with the intent of making someone feel a certain way, to making someone feel comfortable, to feel nurtured, to feel safe, um, that is the thread. It's the emotional connection that I see um, everywhere I go. And it's fascinating for me to, to, to study how, what, what the tools and tricks are and the ingredients are for each place that add that little layer of comfort. So, um, in the south, you'll find that from long, slow cooking of vegetables, uh, sneaking in a little bit of uh, country ham. Uh, you go to West Africa and it's sun-dried seafood. You go to Italy and it's anchovies. And so, once I realized that we're all trying to do the same thing, uh, we just do it with with our ingredients that belong to our place, then the whole world just opened up. So, I'm going to quote again this Frenchman who reacts around, please don't tweet about it. <laughs> but another phrase he had beyond the coming with me and I'll tell you who you are, he said, the future of the nations will depend in how they feed themselves. A person that Sean brought is helping us, is guiding us to understand who we are, where we come from, how we should be feeding ourselves. Not only physically, but even more spirit. Uh, thanks to Sean, as a new American, I know better who I am, I know better even where I come from, and I know even better where I'm not. And I hope you are feeling the same, so please, how do you give a big round of applause to this amazing group? I think we have 10, 15 minutes of questions, and we now in Washington, we are all very opinionated. No filibusters. So, please, raise your hand, and I think we'll bring a mic next to you. Do we have mics in place? So, we are very good in Washington to shouting, <laughs> so please, the gentleman with the hat, uh, let's make America great again, please, uh, speak up. We want to make sure we give voice to everybody in Washington, D.C. <laughs> we should become the 51st state. <laughs> Young cooks. Uh, what kind of advice you give to young cooks who are 
uh, looking to carry on the work with commitment to learning about food and sharing that with people uh, through cooking. Thank you very much. So, thanks, Jess. I think the first question you should ask yourself, the first thing you should do is make a list of the things that you love. And then find a chef that is a master of those things. And suck their brains dry. <laughs> every single thing. Um, that's what I did. And it's the most important thing that I, I still tell myself every single day is that I know nothing. And I love waking up every day and knowing that there's so many discoveries to be had. Um, and I think one of the most important things that I could, I could say is to understand the power of surrounding yourself with people who believe in the same things that you believe in. And if you find yourself in a room um, with people on a team that uh, don't, see, uh, don't have the same beliefs, then you have to leave immediately. Let me be uh, very quickly. Do you know who uh, Amelia Simmons was? Anybody knows who Amelia Simmons was? Is your hand? All right. Anybody knows who Hercules was? No, no, no. Anybody knows who Hercules was in American history? Anybody here? You know. One, that's good. Anybody knows who Mary Randolph was? One, two, anybody else? All right. Wow, we need to make America great again. So Amelia Simmons, Mary Randolph, and Hercules were three of the most important people in early American history when we talk about food. If you don't know who Hercules was, you should go to the Folgers Library and find out about who became the first Afro-American cook slave cooking for George Washington. Do you know who Amelia Simmons was? Was the first woman that brought, even was a copy from a British book. I don't think she was very wise by copying a British book, but that's another story. <laughs> nah, that's a joke. I like British people. <laughs> I just come back to his cooking. Amelia Simmons was a woman that wrote the first printed American cookbook in America. If you don't know who Mary Randolph was, she was really in 1926, one of the early printouts or original cookbooks of American cooking. So if really we know who we are, and you want to know who you are in terms of America and American cooking, we need to be doing deeper in what Chef Shambro has done, understanding the South, but America as a whole, we need to be better in knowing who those three people were. And I can give you 50 other names. An immigrant like me that came 27 years ago should be lecturing you about who these three people were. But actually, that's why immigrants like me were here, to awaken who America is by remembering where we come from, who we are. So we are not afraid of welcoming new immigrants like me. And we understand that we all need to be better than Flavor and nutrition 
but we're also not cooking at home. And knowing that and, and, and being semi-aware of the fact that that's probably not going to change anytime soon, then I truly believe that it falls on the shoulders of of restaurants to use their platform. However many people come to that restaurant each day as guests eat, is we have to continue to, to tell the truth of the food and and distill the importance um, of keeping these, these ingredients and these traditions alive. I think it's one of our biggest uh, responsibilities because once we start thinking about food that way, and thinking a little bit deeper, it leads us down paths to understand um, who our neighbors are. Um, it, 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 it's truly the thread that I think can hold the community together. I mean, I, I'm only going to disagree with uh, Chad Brook, only because he's more fun to disagree and create controversy and then people to read about it. But, I don't want anybody to cook at home. I want them to come to my restaurant. <laughs> I mean, these books actually work. Mine not work. Why? Because I want you to fail. I want you to come to my restaurant. Come on, man. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's a joke, but it's part truth. <laughs> I want you to go home and then come for a second lunch in my restaurant. <laughs> But then you'll be okay. I'm gonna I'll try to answer you with a deeper question because it's a very important question. How many of you bought from Amazon in the last year? Raise your hand. So, and then you are the people that support local, that want your local communities <laughs> to do better. But then you're buying a book on Amazon. And by the way, I love Amazon. I want to own Amazon. I love that. <laughs> I don't have a problem with big companies doing well. Actually, I want them to do well. But in the process of them doing well, helping everybody else on the way. It's true that these programs within the big companies, including Walmart and others, that help the small businesses. But you cannot be complaining in your little town or in your neighborhood that the stores that you love are closing down when you don't go to buy from those stores because you can buy three dollars cheaper without moving from home and it's convenient. My question to you then is do you want to support those farmers with new seeds? How many of you went to the farmers market this weekend when it was raining? I'm going to tell you, I didn't see many of you because many of those farmers markets were empty. Why? Because we were, many of us sometimes, buying online. Because we didn't want to get wet. Even if the farmers show up, driving for three hours to sell us their last tomatoes of the season. So what I mean is, we cannot finger point at others when things are not going in the way we drink. If we keep finger pointing, it means that we're not taking care of our own. If you want local farmers to do better, if you want seeds not to disappear, if you want all crops to come back, if you want your neighborhood to do better, if you want your community to thrive, we need to start putting our dollars, our actions, not use our thinking where it matters. You want local, you want driver, you want farmers, you want local milk, you want local seeds, you want local fruits. They start showing up when it's rain. They start buying from them. They start being so convenient of ordering everything online. And they start making change one shopping at a time. We are the change if we want to make a change. If not, we are part of the problem too. Me first. So that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Uh, let's choose uh, somebody that is not a male. Yeah, women's questions. Sorry, don't take it personal. Okay, thanks. Quick question. Um, my mother's from South Carolina. We grew up in South Carolina. We live in D.C. now. Wonderful children. 
She brings up self-rising flour from South Carolina to make biscuits at Thanksgiving. Is that a locally sourced issue? She thinks they're much better bringing up self-rising flour. I just need to know scientifically if this is the right thing. Is that flower white lily? Woo! What is it? So, this is a perfect example of why it's important to know what is in those bags. Because what's in that bag is a very particular kind of wheat harvested at a very specific time. That's why it is the way it is. That's why it makes the best biscuits. And so, if we can know what that type of wheat is, when it was harvested, where it came from, then we can go to the farmer's market and ask farmers to grow these things and <coughs> support them, and then it's going to be a hundred times more delicious and nutritious than what comes in that bag. I, I think we'll only add one thing. I mean, when you put grandmother ahead of anything, like, what the heck? I'm sure it's better, and I'm sure it's worth it. It's like a turkey. I mean, I'm so sorry, but, you know, after 27, 28 years in Spain with turkey, but in Christmas, I'm a Catholic boy, so, you know, I can go Sundays and ask for forgiveness, so it's a great religion uh, in so many ways. And I, you know, I ate so many bad turkeys in Christmas, so dry, but my grandmother made it. So you ever heard me come? Oh, it was the best turkey I've ever eaten. It was so moist, it was so tasty. Oh my God. It's amazing how we make up the stories of our home cooking. It's the only time we're allowed to lie. Ever. Why? Because it's a power of that family cooking and those experiences that is beyond of the dish itself. It sends you the message who you are, where you come from, who you belong to, who is taking care of you, and who you will fight for, protect always. That's what food says. So I'm sure it's worth it. And if anything, she should be bringing that flower to every one of us in this room. Period. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Yes, sir. But you're close by. Hi, how are you, Chef? Um, I looked up being here for a long time. Um, something to think about is we're constantly chefs and we're constantly paired with beverage. Um, that's a really big thing that I've learned from you, and I've learned that there's a limit. Um, in your next project, how are you training your staff to deal with the beverage that's ahead, but realizing the consequences and also um, allowing them to relax and not feel uncomfortable about it at the same time? So, the, the first word that comes to mind is moderation. Right. Something that I've struggled with, uh, with photography, with guitars, all kinds of things. Um, so the bar program at the restaurant is designed to, to teach moderation. So we're taking this idea, and also I want to be able to participate in the bar program. And so what we're doing is each day we will make six drinks based on whatever is the best at the farmer's market, and we'll juice you know, or process those fruits or vegetables all in the and then season them with alcohol. And focus on this idea of seasoning these things with spirits. Um, and so, let's see, let's see how that works. I think I mentioned before, I'm, I'm so proud of Sean Time Ford because I don't believe it's only for our industry. But we see that America today, we have the big problem with opioids. Call it whatever, it's these kind of things that we go for. Um, when we feel to be away from where we are, call it drugs, call it alcohol. Really alcohol in the right measure 
o can whine to them. It's okay, but I'm not going to lie to you when I tell you that she was a big influence in my life. Um, I would not consider myself a heavy drinker, but I will not lie to you that sometimes I go with three, four margaritas in my body quickly like that. And it's not something I'm proud of. Maybe if you see me in a Stephen Colbert, I'll make fun of it. But if anything, thanks to people like Sean, I began making less fun of it. Because every time somebody sees somebody like me or him making fun of drinking alcohol, it's almost like you are. I'm talking now like a father, my three daughters. If they see you making even fun of getting high on alcohol, means like almost you are saying it's okay. And I need to be conscious on it because maybe it's okay if really you have a very good support but very quickly can go in the wrong way and it's only more one night that you overdid it becomes every other week and then becomes every other weekend and then becomes every week then becomes every day before you realize so this is something we all need to be supporting each other on especially in our businesses but what I think and I would like to end this way is that Sean Brooke has shown us that he's an amazing American, an amazing Southern, an amazing chef. A person that is fighting on behalf of farmers that has no voice, on behalf of people that are voiceless that we don't know. He's really bringing back recipes and ingredients that are forgotten. He's helping us to understand who we are as America. But beyond even that, he's a chef that is leading the way coming up forward in moments that his life maybe was not so perfect because everybody's trying to portray that we have this perfect life when actually they're not but actually it's in the learning, in the process of knowing who we are through our food and our ways to behave with that food we are becoming very better citizens so help me again a person that deserves everything we can to show support for who he is who had who Everything he has helped influence, making people like me, people like you, people like us better, one dish at a time, one story at a time, and showing that we are more than the food we eat. We are who we are, being there for others. Sean showed me that every single day. He has shown all of us what the chef, what the person can be in our community. So, Sean brought people.